We're going to read today from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. I really like today's lesson. And so let's read together. Let's read with enthusiasm. And let's read with a little bit of a lower speed because I, I had a lot of caffeine this morning. And so, For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for those of us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is evoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And the Lord placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. We've got one more slide from a different passage, let's throw that slide up and let's say this together with enthusiasm. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that as Paul articulates in Ephesians, there is so much that needs to happen in our lives for us to open our spiritual eyes and understand and apply your word. But also as James says, ultimately it's up to us. I thank you for each person that you've brought here today, Lord. I thank you that I can be here and share this word. And I pray that we would hear it, we would understand it, but most importantly, Lord, we would apply it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your seats. Welcome to weekend three of this 40 Days in the Word. I want to remind you this is very, very important. I want to remind you there are really three very important aspects of this. Number one, you need to listen. You need to listen to the sermon. Every weekend, I'm giving you a sermon which articulates the different things that you need to know. Secondly, you need to watch the video devotionals. We're sending them out. They're on Facebook, on the IES Facebook timeline. I put it on my timeline, and then we send them out to the different groups. They're six, seven, eight-minute devotionals by different Bible teachers. Excellent stuff. It's easy to do. I'm sure you have time in traffic to watch a video from your phone. And then finally, it's being part of a life group. Now, let me say this so everybody understands. The life group material is not the same as the devotional. The life group material is not the same as the devotional. The life group material is not the same as the devotional. So I was in my life group, I said, should we watch the the material? And they said, oh, I already watched it. You've sent the link. It's not the same thing at all. The, 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 the life group material is very different. It fits together nicely. There's a lesson. There are, a, there are questions that you answer, you discuss together, and there are assignments for you to do. If you are not part of a life group, then you need to join for the remaining period of time or on your way out, get a thumb drive, get a DVD, get a workbook, and do it on your own, or do it with your family, or do it with your friends, or you know whoever you want to do it with. But you can do it on your own. That's not the best way to do it, but you'll still gain a lot from doing it. And so please make sure that you participate in that way. All right, if you've got the worksheet with you, go ahead and take out your worksheet as we, as we work on less, uh, the lesson number three of this particular series. Let me ask you this question. Have you ever actually thought, you know, I don't really get anything out of reading the Bible. I don't really get anything about listening to the Bible if you listen to an audio Bible or I don't really get anything about listening to sermon get anything about listening to sermons. If you thought that, you've probably not said it to me, but you may have said it to other people. Well, if you've ever thought that or said that, this weekend is for you. The fact of the matter is the Bible can be a difficult book if you don't understand an important principle. And the principle that we're going to talk about today is illumination. Now, I've heard people say to me, well, Pastor Dave, it's your job to study the Bible. 
and you went to school to study the Bible. Therefore, it's easy for you, but it's hard for us. And this is where I want you to understand this important principle. Illumination is not based on how long you went to school, what seminary you went, or even whether you understand Greek or Hebrew, which I, I don't understand those languages either. And illumination is based on something else that all of us have access to, and that is the work of the Holy Spirit. What we're going to talk about is this principle of illumination. In week one, we talked about inspiration. And I gave you seven reasons that you can trust God's word. Week two, last week, we talked about the Bible as foundation. Seven reasons that God gave us his word and what a difference it can make in your life. Now we're going to talk about the issue of illumination. Illumination simply means being lit up. I'm always very suspicious when I go to a restaurant, and when I go into the restaurant and I sit down, you can't really see things. Have you ever been one of those places where they, they give you a menu and you have to like hold it really close to the candle to be able to read it, or everybody you see is taking out their phone? My question is, why don't they want people to see the food? I think that's very, very suspicious. I don't like to go to a place like that, and, and you know, I'm really nervous. And then I was shocked to find out that they actually have restaurants in the world where it's pitch black on the inside, completely dark, and you sit at a table with the foods in front of you, and usually they don't give you knives and forks because you can imagine what would happen, people reaching around for food and other people with knives and forks. And then the waiters have like these, uh, you know, they all, look like, uh, they all look like they're Delta Force people because they have these uh, light amplifier glasses on and, and they serve all the food. I have no interest in going to a place like that. They say that the food will taste better because your other senses are more alert. I'm sorry, I grew up in this part of the world and when I think of a dark room with food, all I think of is cockroaches <laughs> and rats. Anyway, we want to be in the light. Illumination is all about light. Where there's no light, you can't see clearly. You can't tell whether it's a rat or a really big cockroach, which would be really, really scary. But the more light you have, the more things are clear. Now, what is illumination? Illumination is letting the Holy Spirit show us, show me, show you the meaning of God's word and how that word applies to your life. Let me say that again. It's important. Illumination is letting the Holy Spirit show me the meaning of God's word and how it applies to my life. Jesus was talking to his disciples before he went back up to heaven, and he said to them, I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not abandoning you after I'm resurrected, but the Holy Spirit is coming. I'm sending the Holy Spirit. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit is going to do is going to show us the things about Jesus. In John chapter 14, 26, Jesus said, the counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all the things and remind you of everything I have said to you. What is the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to teach you the things that you need to know, and he's going to remind you of what? Of what Jesus said. Now, what are the things you need to know? The things you need to know are the things Jesus said. Uh, years ago, there was a, a pastor in the, in the West Coast. His name was Jerry Cook. And Jerry Cook was a, a, a tremendous man of God, was one of the pastors who built a, a, a large church in the city of Oregon and uh, in the city of Portland, Gresham, actually, and had a lot of influence on a lot of people, especially me. He wrote a fabulous book called Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness, which, like, all pastors should read. And uh, in those days, uh, it was a certain kind of a stage of what was going on and the Holy Spirit was doing where everybody wanted to have other people tell them what the Lord was saying to them. And people would always come up to you, what is the Lord? What, do you have a word from the Lord for me? Do you have a word from the Lord for me? And Jerry Cook, when people would come up to him and they'd say, do you have a word for the Lord for me? And he would say, yes, read the Bible. Because you know that the Bible is absolutely God's word for you. John 14, 17 said, he is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And a little bit later in John 16, he says this, I have many things to tell you, but you can't handle them now. But when the friend comes, the spirit of truth, he will take you by the hand and guide you into all the truth there is. He won't draw attention to himself, but he will make sense about of what is going to happen. And indeed, of all of I have done and said, he will honor me. He will take from me and deliver it to you. Everything the Father is, has is also mine. That's why I've said he takes from me and delivers to you. What does this mean? What are this, this thing that we talk about? What are these things that are going on? Well, what we need to understand, it is the Holy Spirit of God, the same Holy Spirit that breathed on the authors to write the Scripture, that now finishes that process by allowing us to understand the Scripture. 
The Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of revelation. That's what it says in verse 17. And he reveals God to us. Not only is the Bible the way God speaks to us, but it is a sure way. Have you ever, have you ever uh, well, in the old days you would have bought a, a DVD, now you download it, but the, the, one of the sound settings is to watch a movie and, and to listen to the soundtrack of the director and the producers and the actors discussing what goes on in the movie. You're, have you ever done that? Any of you ever done that? Do you find it interesting? Sometimes it's interesting. Sometimes it's almost disappointing. You think, really? Seriously? Something like that? But what you have is you have the people on one side of the creative process explaining all the things that went into it. Whether you like that or not, you have something like that in the Scripture. Because the Holy Spirit is the author of the Scripture, and he reveals stuff to us as we read it. Imagine reading a book while the author is sitting there with you, explaining things to you. And so you can ask God, God, what does this mean to me? How can it make a difference in my life? Well, how am I supposed to use this today? What are you trying to say to me? And then the light goes on. That's how illumination works. In verse 18, uh, in verse 18 Paul says, I pray the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order for you to know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance. Did you know your, eyes, your heart had eyes? What is, what, what, that's a figure of speech, of course, but what's the point of the figure of speech? Well, think about it. How do you interact with the word, the world around you? You interact through the world around you, the physical world, with physical senses. Hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting. Uh, we talked about this earlier, that, ba- that the small children have extra taste buds in their tongue so that they can use their taste buds more effectively. Just like there's a physical world all around us, there's also a supernatural world. Don't get confused. The fact that it's supernatural doesn't mean it's invisible and it's, it's, it's the same thing as this physical world. That's not it at all. The whole point of supernatural is that it's outside of the physical world. It's not invisible to the physical world. It's not physical at all. And we interact with the supernatural world through the spiritual senses and we use a terminology like the eyes of our heart to explain that. Now, you may think, some people think the spiritual world is kind of insignificant, but the Bible tells us that the spiritual world will actually outlive this physical world. In fact, in one real sense, the spiritual world is the real world, and this physical world is the temporal world. The kingdom of God, the presence of our Father God, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you and I will outlive this physical world. And so it's important for us to spend our time knowing and understanding with spiritual eyes how we can see all of these things. Now, this is what illumination is all about. Now, for some of you, this has never happened. You look at the Bible and you think, hmm, I don't believe this, I believe that. But you've never had that experience. For some of you, it's happened on occasion. But what we're going to talk about today today, is the way that we can make it happen on a regular basis so that our spiritual eyes are open. First of all, we want to talk about what happens when our spiritual eyes are open. What benefit will we get when our spiritual eyes are open? And so the first thing we want to do is look at some of the things from Scripture. Now, I really like this part because we're going to look at four stories from Scripture that illustrate in the stories what these things happen. One of the things I've noticed as as I get older and older that I tend to answer questions more and more and more with stories instead of with answers. Ray Vanderland in his great series of of videos that talk about the the world of of, uh, the Holy Land, he makes that very same uh, statement in the beginning. He talks about how the difference between propositional truth and and the way that people perhaps with a different outlook, he refers to it as, as more of an Eastern way of thinking, will refer to things. And he says, you know, propositional truth says God is omniscient. He knows everything. Omnipresent. He is everywhere. Everlasting. He is eternal. Uh, and, and, and those kind of things. And then the other perspective says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want Even when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. One is a straight answer that's propositional, and one is a story that says the whole thing. And we're going to look at four stories that illustrate these four important principles that we can gain from when we open, when God opens our spiritual eyes. First of all, when God opens our spiritual eyes, we can see things that he wants us to see that we're not seeing. Number one, I see the solution to my problems. When I turn 
allow God to illuminate my mind, I see the solution to my problem. So the first story is from Genesis chapter 21. This is an amazing story. It's the story of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and their sons Isaac and Ishmael. You might be familiar with this story. When Abraham is about 90 years old, an angel comes to him and says, Abraham, because of your faithfulness to God and your love for God and your commitment to God, you're going to have a son, and your son is going to be the forefather of a great nation. And Abraham says, I'm 90. And Sarah says, no way. That's not going to happen at all. I promise you I'm not having kids. And so they have this problem. But they have this promise. And so they're trying to figure out what's going to go on, and then Sarah comes up with plan B. Sarah says to Abraham, leave me alone. I'm too old to have a baby, but there's got to be a promise, so do this. Take my assistant, my handmaiden, Hagar, and she'll be a surrogate mother to you, and you can have a baby through her. The baby will still be your descendant. I'm going to fix God's problem. We always have a problem when we try to think God has a problem that we need to fix. And so Abraham says, hmm, Hagar, yeah, that sounds like a good idea to me. That's my parenthetical statement right there. So Hagar gets pregnant with Abraham's child, and we realize, you and I, that this is not God's plan at all. This is, this is Sarah's plan. It's not God's plan. And what happens is this baby is born, he's a beautiful baby, and they name him Ishmael, and he grows up. Abraham holds Ishmael up before God and says, God, you have given me a promised boy. And God says, uh, that's not my plan. That's somebody else's plan plan. God loves Ishmael. He's a good child. God does not reject him. In fact, God blesses him and makes him a great nation, but he's not the one I was talking about. And by a miracle later, Sarah becomes pregnant, and she has a little boy named Isaac. So here we go. We've got Abraham. We've got Sarah. We've got Hagar. We've got Isaac. We've got Ishmael. We have the makings of a great Sinatron right here. I mean, this is the story for all ages. And of course, you know what happens. Sarah gets upset. She starts getting jealous. Ishmael's the older one. He's going to get the blessing. All of these things are going to happen. And so she, he, she, forces, uh, she forces Abraham to throw them out. And Abraham has to do it. And so we pick up this story in uh, Genesis 21, verse 14. So Abraham got up early the next morning. He prepared food in a container of water. He strapped them onto Hagar's shoulders. He sent her away with their son. And she wandered aimlessly in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water was gone, she put the boys in the shade of a bush. And then she went and sat by herself a hundred yards away. I don't want to watch the boy die, she said as she burst into tears. Man, anybody who's a parent understands that. But God heard the boy crying. And the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven. Hagar, what's wrong? Don't be afraid. God has heard the boy crying as he lies there. Go to him and comfort him, for I will make a great nation of his descendants. And in verse 19, then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a well full of water. She quickly filled her water container and gave the boy a drink. Here's the point. When God opens your eyes, you see things that sometimes they were even there before, but you see them in the way as God's provision. God's solution. When God opens your eyes, when he illustrates the word of God through the word of God, you can see a solution to your problem. Story number two. The second benefit of having your eyes spiritually open is that you begin to understand and see the barrier to your progress. Now, we told a story for the first one. It's a great story, but this is a really unusual story. This is perhaps one of the most bizarre stories in the Old Testament. We find this story come up in Numbers chapter 22. You may not believe me as I tell you this story, so you want to mark that and go back and read it later. Later, okay? Make sure you do that. Here's the story, one of the weirdest stories. There's a guy named Balaam, and Balaam is a prophet of God, and he's a man of God, and he proclaims what God says. And when God tells him to bless someone, they're blessed. And when God tells him to curse someone, they're cursed. But the problem is he's not only a P-R-O-P-H-E-T prophet, he's also interested in P-R-O-F-I-T prophet. And somebody comes along and wants to make profit for the prophet by getting him to curse God's people. And Balaam doesn't want to do it at first, but originally or eventually he he agrees to do it, and then God begins to block him as he tries to go, riding on his donkey. 
So the first thing that happens is he's moving forward. He's going to the place where they want him to make this, this prophet venture by saying, by cursing somebody that God is blessing, of course, Israel. And he doesn't realize that there's an angel blocking the way, and the donkey does. And so the donkey stops. It won't go forward. And so he gets mad at the donkey. He curses the donkey. He beats the donkey. And then he moves on. The second time it goes on to say, the angel of the Lord stood at a place where the road narrowed between two vineyard walls. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord standing there. It tried to squeeze by, just like sometimes happens in traffic here. Tried to squeeze by and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. Apparently, they didn't have that thing where the side mirrors on a donkey you could fold in, you know, like, like we do here in Jakarta. You know, we often get hurt when we try and do what God is, doesn't want us to do. Balaam got his foot crushed. Some of you have gotten your hopes crushed. You insisted on doing something that God didn't want you to do. You pushed and you pushed and you pushed. You say, Pastor Dave, how was I supposed to know what God wanted me to do? Listen. That's the whole issue of illumination. And then it goes on to say, Then the angel of the Lord moved further down the road, stood in a place so narrow the donkey could not get by at all. This time when the donkey saw the angel, it just lay down under Balaam. Smart donkey. He's not going to fool with angels. He just collapsed. He just gives up. And Balaam gets off and he just beats that donkey with his staff. Now here comes the weird part. Then the angel, uh, then the Lord gave the donkey the ability to speak. You know what the donkey said? Are we there yet? <laughs> Come on. Don't tell me some of you haven't seen Shrek. Anyway, uh, later somebody made a movie out of this. No. The donkey said to him, what have I done that you deserve, that deserve your beating me three times? And Balaam said, you made me look like a fool. He's talking to a docking donkey, and he said, you made me make like a fool. If I had a sword, I would kill you. And the donkey said, I'm the same donkey you've ridden all your life. Have I ever done anything like this before? And Balaam said, no. And then the Lord opened Balaam's eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing on the roadway with a drawn sword. And Balaam bowed his head and were, fell down on the ground before him. See, the point of this very strange story is obvious. There are times in your face, in your time, in your life where God is blocking you and you're frustrated because you didn't know that it was God who was stopping you. You keep trying to push forward. God is blocking you, but God's not blocking you because he doesn't like you, he doesn't want you, he doesn't care if you succeed. God is trying to keep you from making a serious mistake. God's wanting to say to you, don't go down that road. What you need to be able to do is understand that you can do one of two things. You can either beat the donkey or you can let God open your eyes. You can either be mad at the people around you. You can complain about all the things that you wanted to do that didn't happen. You can blame other people or sometimes blame yourself. Or you can say, God, why did you set up this barrier? And when we see, allow God to show us what's going on. We can understand. We can see the barrier. Let's go on. Number three. I see the defense for what's happening, what's attacking me. This is another great story. This is a story about Elisha and the Arameans, not Armenians. This is a country called Aram. And Aram is always attacking uh, Israel in the Old Testament. They're always coming out war against the Old Testament. And every time they come in, God tells Elisha what's going on, and Elisha tips off the king of Israel, and he's always ready for them when they attack. They have a battle and everything else, but because they're tipped off, it things the, the, the Israel people always do well. And so we're picking up the story in, in, um, in uh, verse, uh, verse 10 of, of 2 Kings chapter 6. This happened, the people of Israel knowing about it, several times. So the king of Aram became very upset. He called in his officers and demanded, which of you is a traitor? Who has been informing the king of Israel my plans? It's not us, Lord, one of the officers replied. Elisha, the prophet of Israel, tells the king of Israel, even the words you speak in the privacy of your bedroom. You don't know how tempted I was to make some kind of political point here, but I'm going to resist that temptation. And the king said, you go and find where Elisha is, and we're going to send troops to seize him. We're going to stop him. The report came back, Elisha is at Dothan, a small town in Israel. So one night, the king of Aram sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround that city. A big army and one guy. When Elisha's servant got up early the next morning, went out and he saw the city surrounded by troops, by chariots, and by horses. He ran back in and he told Elisha, what do we do now? He cried out. And Elisha said, don't be afraid. 
for there are more on our side than on theirs. And his servant says, hmm, he's getting old. We're surrounded by horses and chariots and warriors, and there's the two of us, you know, back to back like some old kung fu movie, back to back, and we're going to do this whole thing here. And then we pick up this in verse 17. The Lord prayed, O Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. You see, there were things he didn't see from a physical perspective, and he was thinking we're going to be defeated, but what he understood, what he learned was that there's a spiritual perspective. He's not afraid anymore because God is on their side. You're going to lose your fear when you know that God is near. Now, what do you think happens in this story? This is really interesting. If I wrote the story, I'm not saying it's made up. If I was the director of the history, I would have had a great massacre there. These are enemies of Israel. But that's not what God does. This is really interesting. This is how it goes. As the army, and army advanced toward them, Elisha prayed, O Lord, please make them blind. And the Lord did as Elisha asked. So Elisha went out and he told them, uh, you've come the wrong way. This isn't the right city. Follow me and I'll take you to the man you're looking for. And then he led them to Samaria. What's in Samaria? The king of Israel with his army that has defeated them in the past. They're all blinded. One guy leads them right into the middle of the army of Israel. As soon as they entered Samaria, Elisha prayed, O Lord, now open their eyes and let them see. The Lord did, and they discovered they were in Samaria. When Elisha's king, the king of Israel, saw the captive army, he shouted to Elisha, Should I kill them? Of course not, Elisha told him. Do we kill prisoners of war? Give them food and drink and send them home again. So the king of Israel made a great feast for the army and army, and he sent them home to their king. And after that, the raiders stayed away from the land of Israel. You see how much better God's way is? They could have wiped them out, and 10 years later, their sons and their grandsons would have been back in another war. But instead, he made them friends. He treated them nicely, and they never came back again. You see, when you open your eyes and you understand what God is doing, then you're going to understand that he has a defense for you. And you won't always see it. You won't always know it. But you can understand that what he does to protect you is not just a protection for today, but a protection for the future. The best way to get rid of an enemy is to turn them into a friend. Fourth story, the fourth benefit of being able to see with spiritual eyes, and have our mind illuminated, is we can see how God is walking with us. You see, when God opens our eyes and we see how he's walking with us, we'll understand that he's really been there all along. You, you may be going through something right now. You may feel lonely. You may feel alone. You, you, you feel like you're a single fighter, the only one out there. But you don't understand that God is there and he's walking along with you. This last story is from the New Testament. It's one of my favorite stories. It's the story that happened just after Jesus was resurrected. And all these rumors are going about, you know, he had told them that he was going to be resurrected. The chief priests knew about it because they set out a guard, but the disciples sometimes weren't sure. Is that metaphorical? Does he really mean that? Does that have something to do with yeast? And, you know, all those questions that they're asking. And there's these guys walking along the road to Emmaus. And all of a sudden, somebody comes and joins them. And as he joins them, he asks them, what are you talking about? And they say, haven't you heard? And then they tell him all of these things. By the way, this story really encourages me for another reason. You know why? Uh, if you've known me very long, you've known that the big, one of the biggest problems I have, one of the greatest barriers to me being a pastor is that uh, I can't recognize people. I don't remember what they look like. I can meet somebody and see them 10 minutes later, and I don't remember that I've ever met them before. You know, it's just a nightmare. I just can't recognize. And, and I discovered after Jesus was resurrected, a lot of people had that same problem. So I feel a lot better, the disciples and all those people. These are disciples walking along. Jesus is with them, and then they say, we, we just don't know what to think. And then Jesus opens Scripture from the very beginning, from Genesis all the way to the end of the prophets, what we call the Old Testament. And he tells them, he shows them how all of these things needed to happen. All of these things were not an accident. They were really God's plan. I, I just, I love this because every time I read through the Gospels and I read the, the writer of the Gospel says, and this happened so that this would be fulfilled, I'm thinking in my mind, that's probably one of the things that Jesus explained to them. He opened up the scripture for them. 
And they get to the place where they're going. He, he's going to continue on. And then they say, please stay for dinner. And then what happens is they sit down in Luke chapter 24, verses 31, 30, 31. They sit down to eat, and he took the bread, and he blessed it. And then when he broke it and gave it to them, their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And then he disappeared. It was Jesus. He was walking that road with us all of the time. We didn't see how God himself was walking with us. That was illumination. In their grief, they couldn't see who Jesus was. In their confusion, they couldn't see who Jesus was. They couldn't see it. They needed their eyes to be illuminated. I don't know what's happened to you this year. I don't know, you, you may be grieving because you lost a loved one. You may be grieving because you lost your health. You may have lost a job. You lost an important relationship or a big deal or something else like that. And just like those two disciples, you're confused, you're grieving, you don't know what the future holds. But Jesus is walking along with you. And when you see Scripture illuminated by the Holy Spirit, you'll understand that he is there. So how do I get this illumination? This is obviously very critical. How can, you know, when we look back, we can usually say, oh, then I understand what Jesus was doing, what God was doing. But how can we have that happen in our lives on a more everyday basis? Five things. Five things you need to do, and this is where you really need to pay attention. Number one, I must begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. You must begin a relationship with Jesus Christ to be able to have illumination. This is really important. One of the things that's been interesting for me in this past week is Billy Graham has passed away, and, and I have seen on Facebook, on so many different people's timeline, this statement, and such and such a date and such and such a time, I went to hear Billy Graham preach in this city, and when they gave an invitation, I stood up from my seat and I walked down, and my life was changed. Now, they began a relationship with Jesus when that happened. Their, their lives, some of them were like dramatically changed immediately, but for many of them, they had no idea where it was going to lead them. But it began. In order for you to be illuminated, to understand the word of God, you must begin a relationship with Jesus Christ. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 14, it says, People who aren't spiritual can't receive the truths from God's Spirit. It sounds foolish to them. They can't understand it. For only those who are spiritual can understand what the Spirit means. In 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it says, The devil who rules this world has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. They cannot see the light of the good news. Nicodemus came to Jesus, and he tried to have a discussion about theology and culture and everything else with Jesus. And Jesus said to him, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And we often think of the context of seeing the kingdom of God of, as, as being saved or being uh, accessible to eternity. But if you read that, John chapter 3, he's talking about you can't see the kingdom of God, and he is the kingdom of God. Jesus said, you can't understand me unless you're born again. Just everybody just bow your heads. Everybody close your eyes. I know that many of you here have a relationship with Jesus, and some of you have walked with him for many, many years. But I suspect that there are some of you here who maybe are trying to do good things, and maybe you're not even trying, but you're just interested in spiritual things. But you want to acknowledge that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I want to invite you to ask him to begin that relationship. Very, very quietly, you just whisper to him, Jesus, I want to begin my relationship with you. And if you make that sincere request, not only is illumination a possibility in your life, but with the Lord's help, you'll grow and grow and grow and know to become to be more like him. And the first step is to understand his word. Father, bless them as they have prayed that prayer. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The second thing that we need to do is we must ask God in faith to open our eyes. It's not just starting a relationship with him, but we also have to ask him in faith to open our eyes. In, uh, in Psalm 119, verse 18, it says, Open my eyes that I might see the wonderful things in your law. This is the prayer that we offer up. Open my eyes that I might see the things, the wonderful things in your law. Thirdly, 
We must come with a humble attitude. Now, what does that mean? If I come to God and I say, God, I need a little help with this, but I've got this thing figured out. I've got this things worked out. I, I don't really need your help on this issue and that issue and everything else. Just solve my business problem. You're not going to get it because you've got to come with a humble attitude. You, you, you've got to come with eyes and heart that are open to him and not the other way around. In Psalm 25, verse 9, it says, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches him them his way. In Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, which is a verse that many of you have memorized, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him. What does that mean, all your ways? But how many ways do you have? How are the ways that you treat your spouse? How are the ways that you treat your children? How are the ways that you treat your family? You treat your employees? What are your sexual ways? your financial ways, your career ways. If you acknowledge him in all of your ways, he will make your path straight. He'll point you to success. If you acknowledge him in all your ways. You can't say, Lord, I acknowledge you on my Sunday ways. Monday through Friday, leave me out. Saturday, I begin to be spiritual. It doesn't work. You've got to be humble. Fourth, I must cleanse my heart of sin and conflict. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. What does it mean to be pure in heart? It doesn't mean perfect. If, only, if God only illuminated the minds of those who were perfect, nobody would ever be illuminated. One of the great baffling things about Scripture in the Old Testament is we, hear, we see the life of David. He failed and he failed and he failed and he failed, and God kept saying, he's got a heart after me. It's okay. And after he was gone, God would say over and over and over, there was nobody like David who followed me and obeyed my commandments. Because the commandments of God are not legal, they're heart. And his heart was pure because every time he knew, he came back to God. So how do you have a pure heart? Confession. Go back to God. Say, forgive me. Get rid of the things that I've done wrong. It's something between you and God. And then number five, you must commit in advance to do what God says. You, you can't God, say, God, show me what to do, and if I like it, I'll do it. It doesn't work that way. Come to him. Psalm 119, 33 and 34, teach me, O Lord, to follow your decrees. Then I will keep them. What's James 1, 22? Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. I must begin a relationship with Jesus. I must ask God in faith to open my eyes. I must come with a humble attitude. I must cleanse my heart of sin and conflict. And I must commit in advance to do what God says.